conversations with people. Many people with addictions, such as cigarettes, will admit that they're pretty isolated. And we need to have friendships. As a therapist, sometimes I'll have people who come in with depression, and they're very isolated, and I'll, their, their big thing for that week is to say hello and get the name of three different people. And maybe you could do that here today. Maybe you'll meet somebody here. You know, the people that are so excited that you're here and they've been preparing for you to come in, you'll find a new friend. If you'll be friendly to them, they'll be friendly too. Because we all need to build healthy relationships. Do you agree? All right. And then the, the last one is that we need to admit that we have a problem, right? We can't acknowledge a problem. We don't have a problem to work on. And one of the things that happens that um, patients or, or people that I work with I teach them about HALT. HALT is an acronym, and I also put a B on it, and I'll tell you. The word is, <clears throat> are you hungry, lonely, or tired, or bored? That is when we have the biggest temptation to go to an addiction, whether it's gambling, drinking, smoking, talking to someone on the internet that would be inappropriate, that is when we're most tempted. And spiritual health, when we grow in Jesus, we seem to have less issues because God is helping us and he has a lot of power if we just tap into it. Isn't it wonderful that our Savior really wants to bless us and help us to get healthier? Amen. And it's wonderful that you're here because hopefully every night you'll be growing in Christ, so that you'll have less issues.
So that's what I'd like to do as we get started tonight. The focus of the Bible is on Christ. I want to make sure that is extremely clear. It's on Christ and His story, which we often call the Gospel. We'll talk more about that as we get along tonight. The central focus of the Gospel is the cross. I really want to stress that. This picture helps to put it right in focus that the central part of the Gospel is the cross of Christ, which is what Good Friday is all about if you remember your Bible history and what we are focusing on. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 17 and 18. He said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the Gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Christ, the power and wisdom of God. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul wants us to know that the gospel has power in it, power to change our lives. And then he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What Paul is saying is that the gospel, the story, his story, Christ's story, has changed his life, Paul's life. That is true of every Christian. Our lives are changed by the gospel. Amen. And that is because the cross is the place where Christ gave himself for us and gave us the power to overcome sin. Review the items. I'd like to review the items that are in the slide um, on the screen for a moment here just to remind you of a couple of things that we mentioned last night. And first of all, I'd like you to be reminded we talked about Cain and Abel and the fact that Abel had brought a lamb to offer as a sacrifice. Cain didn't like that and he slew his brother because he was jealous because God honored his sacrifice of the lamb instead of uh, Cain's sacrifice. Abel had obeyed God and did what God asked him to do. Cain disobeyed God and brought what he thought was okay to bring. That is a good clue to us as Christians. Sometimes we think it's okay to do it our way, but maybe we ought to ask God more and do it our own way less. And so God had that particular experience with, uh, with these two young brothers. Abel was killed, and that began a whole other story I don't have time for tonight. And then as the children of Israel came out of Egypt, you see that in the back of the picture, they made their way out into the wilderness, and there God told them, we talked about last night, to build a sanctuary. And the sanctuary was there for a reason, because God, who appeared to them on the mountain, Mount Sinai, wanted to also meet with them in the sanctuary and get acquainted with them and bless them with his fellowship with them. But he really wanted to teach them something, which we'll talk about in a moment. We talk, though, about that service and that experience. All of these experiences involve a lamb which represented Christ who would be the lamb who would die for us. We talked about that last night. Along with that, we talked about the sanctuary. And we discussed the fact that there was a prophecy in the book of Daniel that helps us to understand uh, that Christ was specifically spoken of as coming at a given time. In Daniel chapter 8 and 9, we discovered the exact year that Jesus' baptism would take place, his crucifixion would take place, and when the gospel would begin to be shared with the whole world and not just the Jews. We went through a time prophecy in order to be able to grasp that, and we found that God was always on time. He did what needed to be done on time, and the prophecy helps us to understand that God is in control of time in which you and I are even living today. 
Then we ask this question, what does that all mean? Why was that important to us? And we discovered that the Jews were told uh, that Jesus would come at a given time, and therefore they should have known the time that the Messiah, Jesus, was going to come. He also told them that they should have been ready for his arrival. He wanted them to be ready. He gave them the information ahead of time. No, he didn't go and tell them out, you know, have big billboards everywhere telling them, because he wanted them to be ready personally by personal study knowing when Jesus was going to come. But they weren't ready for him. They should have embraced him when he came as their long-awaited Messiah. All of this had been told ahead of time. That also means something for us today. We want to know what it is God wants us to know as well. When we look in uh, Daniel last night, we also not only looked in chapters 8 and 9, we looked in Daniel chapter 2. By the way, I threw a lot at you last night. And I know that. And I had to try to cover a couple of things to try to give you a big picture. Tonight I'm going to slow down a little bit and I'm going to try not to overfeed you like we did last night. But last night we did talk about a prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. And in there we spoke about a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had, and how that Daniel was able to interpret it. And you can go back and review that on your own if you're new to that concept. But we read about the interpretation that God gave of the history of the world in advance to Daniel, which he then gave to Nebuchadnezzar. And that they were going through, uh, that the world would go through four world empires and then a divided world would develop until, finally, Jesus would come. The Bible made it very clear about these particular issues and these times and these uh, things because God wanted us to know in advance that He was in control of the world, but that He would one day come and end all of our pain and suffering. And that is good news for you and me. Amen. But I want you to remember that in this little summary that there were four main kingdoms that we know from history were exactly what the Bible said they would be. But then the last kingdom, Rome, to rule the world in its entirety eventually evaporated and was replaced by multiple kingdoms and that's the way the world stands even today. And the Bible tells us it would stay that way until Jesus would come again. We also talked a little bit about what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 24. I want to expand a little bit. I didn't go into it very much last night because of time. But I want to expand it this evening just a little bit to give you a better perspective of what Jesus was trying to say. In Matthew chapter 24, the Bible tells us that the disciples asked him, as they were looking over the uh, Mount of, from, on, from the Mount of Olives over onto Jerusalem, and the temple sitting there, the magnificent temple that Herod had built, they were looking over there, and Jesus had told them that the temple would be destroyed, and in three days he would raise it up. Now, he was really talking about himself. But he was trying to help them to understand the significance, and he was telling them that eventually the temple would be destroyed, and he explained that a little bit later in this. We don't have to go in time, time to go into that. But they felt that if the temple was going to be destroyed, it had to be the end of the world. So they said, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus uh, responded to their question by giving them some explanations along the way. This is what he told them. We skipped over the details. I want to give you a little bit of it. He said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, that was one of the clues. You know, we see more rumors of wars and more war of wars today in our world over the last 150 years or so 
than the world has ever seen in terms of deaths. In, in uh, World War I, 24 million people died. In World War II, 60 million people died. And in that century alone, the 20th century, more people died in warfare than in the previous 2,000 years. In World War I, so many people died, they felt and hoped it was a war to end all wars. But unfortunately, it didn't work that way. And since World War II, there's been the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the war in Afghanistan, and on and on it goes. As you look at a map of the wars that are ongoing and continue to pop up, especially we see them centering around the Middle East and Africa and other parts of the world as well. There's continued saber rattling even today in North Korea, in Russia, and in China. Wars and rumors of wars abound. Just a couple days ago, I heard that uh, Korea was claiming to have tested a new weapon. I didn't get to get into all of that. Again, that saber rattling continues on and on. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 7, that there would be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. There are famines and food crises affecting millions of people all over the world. We find that one child today dies every five seconds from hunger. You start doing the math on that, it's staggering. We know from worldhunger.org that 925 million people are hungry in this world. And from the time that this statistic was put on the slide, it may have changed as well. There are also pestilences. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, said that there would be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Pestilences are diseases. We know that AIDS kills more than 2 million people every year, even in, um, and, and that includes 55 people a day in our own country from HIV, 2 million people every uh, year in the world. That's one every 15 seconds. Heart disease kills 27 million people that have been living with di and have been diagnosed with heart disease. 26 million people are living with diabetes. 1.5 million new cancer cases pop up every year. 600,000 cancer deaths every year. And then there's SARS, which we haven't heard much about lately, but it, those kinds of things pop up. Ebola keeps coming up, mad cow disease, bird flu, you name it, there's so many of these different things, they don't even seem to be able to keep up. And then more recently we've had the, those kinds of uh, things that are mosquito-born that scared everybody down in Brazil, and so on. These things continue on. How about earthquakes? There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, we are told. If you look at uh, the record of earthquakes in the last even 10 to 15, 20 years, there have been massive earthquakes, including the one in Japan that killed 15,000 people. We can remember the pictures of the tsunami flooding into Japan and the people and vehicles being rushed out to sea, many people losing their lives. There have been devastating earthquakes in Iran, in Chile, in New Zealand, in Indonesia. In 2004, one earthquake caused a tsunami that killed a staggering 230,000 people. And we hardly blink an eye that that happened 15 years ago. These kinds of things continue on just the way Jesus said they would. There are so many of these kinds of things taking place. I don't know what you think Jesus would say to apply to us today. The Midwest floods this year similar to the ones we had in 1993, the tremendous devastation that was done there. Wonder, I wonder if we couldn't indeed be living on the edge of eternity because Jesus said that when we saw these things, we would know that it was just before he would return. As a matter of fact, Jesus in the same passage in Matthew 24 said, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he continued, um, and we go back, I should say, to uh, Genesis, and we compare the days of Noah 
and we begin to realize that it sounds very familiar to our own time. Because the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the hearts uh, thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. A little further down in Genesis 6 it says the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Anybody know what the date is today? April 19. Anybody remember what happened on April 20? 20 years ago? Can you believe it was 20 years ago? Look in the bottom right-hand corner of this picture taken from Columbine High School video. These two young men, men who went in and shot up their school, and we've seen so many more of those kinds of things since that time. Violence has become almost common to us. And Jesus said, all these are really just the beginning of sorrows. What does it all mean? It means that Christians should know the time when Jesus is going to come. Christians should be ready for His arrival, and they should embrace Him as their long-awaited Savior. Amen. That is the reminder that we get at this season of the year, this holiday time when the world may be focusing on other things, even centering in the death of Christ, but failing to recognize that Jesus' death is also a reminder to us of what He wants to do in our lives today in preparing for His soon return. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36, But in that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We may be able to look into the sanctuary prophecy in Daniel 8 and 9 and know the exact year when Jesus was going to die on the cross, when He would be baptized, when the message of the gospel would go not just to the Jews, but to all the world. That was prophesied then. But Jesus said, No one knows the day when I will return. But he, in the same passage of Matthew 24, said, but when you see these things happening, know that my return is imminent. Christ is the center of our study. We're studying prophecy so that this Jesus Christ can light up my heart and your heart. This Christ can give me confidence and assurance and hope in a world in deep trouble. I'd like to share a quick story with you. It begins with 12, uh, I'm sorry, 12, about a half a dozen people standing at the open door of a plane. Now, the plane is flying, and you know trouble is about to happen when people jump out of planes, right? That's why we usually stay in those planes. But at 12,000 feet, over the Phoenix, uh, plains of Phoenix, Arizona, Debbie Williams and a half dozen of her friends were about to jump out of the plane. They had a reason for doing this. They had a beautiful day, and they were experienced divers, and they were planning to form a formation in midair. There were about a half dozen of them to do this, and that was their plan. So a few seconds into her own free fall, Debbie went into what they call a corkscrew, and it was a maneuver to speed up her ability to get to the rest of the group because when you're falling, you only have so much time to get connected. So she had to speed up together. But she miscalculated and she went slamming at 50 miles an hour into one of her companions. It knocked her unconscious and bounced her away limp as a rag doll. Her parachute had not been opened. She was plummeting toward earth and no way to open her parachute. She went shooting by her, uh, pat, her instructor and also a jump master whose name was Gregory Robertson or is Gregory Robertson. He noticed as she flew by him the blood on her face and realized that something was desperately wrong. Immediately, he forced himself into a, a body dive, a no-lift dive that would allow him to go at maximum speed 
of 180 miles an hour in order to try to reach her literally in mid-air. When he looked up to check, it seemed as though Debbie was still falling away from him, but he kept going. And as the horizon rose up to meet him and her, and he kept going faster and faster. He maneuvered his shoulders so that he could guide into the descent near to Debbie and managed to get to her. He reached out and grabbed Debbie's um, reserve cord. All, you know, I can't imagine how this all happened and transpired. Literally was seconds to spare and grabbed that rip cord of her reserve chute and the cord opened, uh, the, the parachute opened up and he moved quickly away to get out of her way and opened up his own chute as he uh, had only about 2,000 feet and 12 seconds left. Debbie and her rescuer both survived. Debbie would recover fully from her injuries and remain always grateful, as you can imagine, to that, di that diver that night who came and saved her life, saved her from a fatal impact. You know what? God has a mid-air plan to rescue the people of this world, too. I don't know about you, but I think we need to be rescued. I think we're in trouble in this world. I think we need to have hope of what God can do and will do for us. The world needs some good news. And the Bible has some good news for us tonight. Revelation contains a prophecy that clearly is God's last warning message to the world. And the first thing in it points to helping us in this troubled world. I want to share it with you this evening. But before I do, I want to give you this reminder of a Bible fact. And that is that God always sends a message to prepare His people for a major event that will affect His people in an eternal way. This is a biblical matter. Now, I don't mean that any time there's a little bit of a, a skirmish someplace that God's going to tell us about that. Or play a time when, you know, 50, 50 people or even 100,000 people will get killed in some catastrophe. But when there's something that affects the world and our eternal salvation, God sends a message. I'll give you a couple illustrations of it. God wants to be able to help men and women to be ready before the calamity hits. In Noah's day, God sent a message to prepare men and women for the coming destruction. He longed for His people to be saved, but the world had gotten so terrible that He had to do something to intervene, or man would have destroyed himself and herself. God loved humanity so much that He allowed Noah to preach for 120 years. He wanted to get the message through and get as many people saved as possible. 120 years of mercy, 120 years of grace, 120 years of loving appeals. And even when it happened, came, there were only a handful or two handfuls, eight people in the ark on that day when God sent the flood. God revealed the same pattern in the days of Joseph. He raised up a man to prepare Egypt for a major coming famine. A message of love was sent to Egypt before the calamity. One of the main reasons for it is because that situation was going to affect um, was going to affect God's people. When something's going to happen that's going to affect God's people significantly, God sends a message. God's people needed to be delivered from the famine that was coming so that He could continue His work among them. In the New Testament, God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. It would be surprising then if God, who sent a message the first time that Jesus came, would not also then in turn send a message for you and me before He comes the second time. It is critical to us that God has all through the history of the world taken care of His people and warned them 
of what is to come. Once again today, he has a special message for us, and the book of Revelation reminds us of that message. In the last book uh, of the Bible, the book of Revelation, God has sent that message that is just as significant as Noah's message, and J Joseph's message, and John the Baptist's message for us in these days. It's God's end time message, and it's found in Revelation chapter 4.